Uh, we must now move on to questions to the Minister of Justice, and I call Mr. David Hildage. Deputy Speaker, question one. Principal Deputy Speaker, a number of ongoing initiatives will help to ensure that Forensic Science Northern Ireland provides services that are cost-effective and support the delivery of faster, fairer justice. Last October, I launched a transformation program within FSNI to increase capacity within the laboratory and improve service delivery. This is a major reform initiative with a capital investment of over £17 million to ensure that FSNI is well placed to respond to the ever changing demands of forensic science. Work has already commenced on new accommodation for evidence recovery and DNA analysis as a result of the capital investment. A contract has also been awarded recently for the development of a new case management system and laboratory information management system. In addition to the capital investment, a service improvement project has been developed to increase capacity and timeliness within the laboratory. A new method for profiling DNA, DNA17, has also been delivered. FSNI is the first forensic science provider in the UK to use the new technology, which will provide significant benefits for the justice system in Northern Ireland. A recent inspection of FSNI by Sijini provided assurance that the scientific expertise provided to the justice system has been maintained at a high level, but identified the need for a more joined-up approach to the delivery of forensic services. A comprehensive action plan has been developed in response to that report. The Department is also committed to developing a strategy for forensic services in partnership with the main criminal justice agencies. The strategy will include forensic services provided by the PSNI and FSNI, taking into account the wider strategic needs of the justice system. I ask members just to use the, uh, the microphones because there's some difficulty with people when they're behind the speaker. David Huldridge for a supplement. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers. I, I know working locally with police and, and victims of crime, there, there does appear to be a lengthy delay in processing currently. What can be done to reduce this in the short term, even until some of these strategies are up and working? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, there's actually quite a lot of work underway in a number of different initiatives to improve the, the speed in which services are provided. Looking, for example, at things like live links to link uh, scientists to the courts and save them taking time away from the lab. Um, we've seen the introduction of a rapid analysis process for cannabis and a new streamlined process for other drugs. And the PSNI is making preparations to include presumptive testing for cannabis, which will also reduce the number of cases which have to be submitted. I believe all of those will help, and we'll also be seeking to provide shorter, more focused reports to ensure that the work can be carried forward more speedily. Sean Lynch. Thank the Minister for his answer. Can the Minister uh, provide an update on his department? in progress in, in its action plan to try and tackle issues of delay and criticism at the length of time taken for the service to produce reports. Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, I, I've just answered that point to Mr Hildish. To some extent, I'm certainly also aware of a number of criticisms which have been made by certain members of the judiciary, not all of which are entirely fair to the staff of FSNI. I've been engaging through the Criminal Justice Delivery Group with the Chief Constable with the DPP, and I also engage regularly with the Lord Chief Justice to see how we can ensure that we get the system better joined up and working better to meet the needs of the system. And I call Mr. Leslie Cree. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I'd like to ask the Minister how much Northern Ireland forensic science related work is actually outsourced? Principal Deputy Speaker, I can't answer that question precisely to Mr Cree, but the, uh, the reality is a very small amount of it is outsourced. The vast majority of the work which is required is carried out within FSNI, although there are obviously certain specialist functions which are used so rarely that it wouldn't be economic for us to manage them within the Sea Park facility. But if Mr Cree has specific questions about specific services, I'll happily answer them. Uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. I'm sure the Minister would be prepared to accept constructive criticism, particularly when it comes from so many people who want an assurance from him that the Forensic Science Service has got the staff and has got the resources to deliver the strategies of which this House is choking with. Well, I, th I think, Principal Deputy Speaker, Mr Dallet highlights uh, a fair point. The issue is not to have the strategies, but to ensure the strategies are implemented. That's why there's a very significant programme going on within FSNI with an additional member of staff 
looking to see that we update the processes. What has certainly emerged from the Sigini report is that the science which is carried out by FSNI bears comparison with any other agency anywhere in Europe, but we certainly need to ensure that the business practices meet the quality of the science. Mr. Stewart Dixon. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Minister, thank you for the information. And welcoming the uh, speeding up and, and improvements to forensic service uh, delivery and all that. And can the Minister explain to the House how that then dovetails into uh, the wider and challenging programmes of speeding up justice generally across the whole system? Well, as most members will have heard me say, Principal Deputy Speaker, speeding up justice is a key issue. And what is absolutely necessary is to ensure that as cases are proceeding for criminal prosecution, the work is done to ensure that all the relevant agencies work together. We have seen significant progress in the work being done between the police service and the PPS. We need to also ensure that, for example, where forensics are required, that they are submitted in a timely way, uh, the research is done in a timely way and reported on in a timely way to meet the ongoing needs. And we have certainly seen some very good progress led by the Lord Chief Justice relating to case management which has ensured that cases are proceeded with more speedily when they get to court. I believe there is an emerging good tale, but it is not yet as good as it should be. And I call Ms. Sandra Overland. Question number two, please, Mr. Dim. With permission, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I would take together questions two, three, eight, eleven, and twelve. I was unaware of the so-called administrative scheme for dealing with on-the-runs. Operation Rapid, the associated letters, and the issuing of broad prerogatives of mercy until shortly before the judgment in the Downey case was made public. On learning the detail of this, I sought an urgent meeting with the Secretary of State. I also received a briefing from a senior NIO official. I have had no contact with the Attorney General for England and Wales in relation to the On the Run scheme. The Secretary of State clarified that the Department of Justice had no responsibility for this scheme, and she apologised for publicly suggesting otherwise. I made clear that the DOJ would have no part in the shabby scheme which was initiated during direct rule before the devolution of justice to Northern Ireland. Although the so-called administrative scheme has apparently continued since the devolution of justice, its operation and the exercise of the royal prerogative of mercy in relation to terrorism are matters for the Secretary of State. I note that the Secretary of State has said that this scheme has now ended and that no letters have issued since December of 2012. The content of these letters and the names of the persons to whom they were issued are also matters for the Secretary of State. However, the Prime Minister has announced that the judge will conduct an inquiry and it is due to report by the end of May. I note also that the Police Ombudsman is carrying out an urgent investigation and that the House of Commons Northern Ireland Affairs Select Committee will also investigate this matter. The outcome of these inquiries should bring a degree of cl clarity which is currently lacking. Sandra Overan for a supplement. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank the Minister for, for his response so far. I wonder, can the Minister inform us, has the PSNI issued any information to the NIO about on the runs without the Minister's knowledge since the devolution of policing and justice powers? I'm afraid, Principal Deputy Speaker, that really does fall into the category of unknown unknowns. I have no knowledge of what information may have passed between the PSNI and the Northern Ireland Office, either before or since devolution. Again, Mr. Sean Rogers. Thank you, Mr. President, Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for his answers thus far. Minister, have you had any cons consultations with our own Attorney General with particular reference to the legality of the letters? Well, I thank Mr. Rogers for the, for the question. Um, I have made it clear that I have sought legal advice. It is not convention that ministers uh, state from whom advice has been sought, and I'm afraid I can't answer that question. Sir Alec Easton. I understand uh, that the Minister knew nothing about this deal, but I understand that his Permanent Secretary did. Has the Minister since had uh, time to discuss this with the Permanent Secretary, and can he tell this House uh, what uh, new information the Permanent Secretary has furnished him? And can he also tell us if he feels his department has now been undermined by this knowledge? Well, I'm afraid Mr Easton is ill-informed. The per Permanent Secretary of the Department of Justice had no knowledge of the scheme. In a previous role in another department, the person who is now the Permanent Secretary of the DOJ was aware of the scheme. But that is an entirely different issue, and members should be very well aware of the convention relating to access to papers of a previous government, where 
There is a convention that papers are not released to incoming ministers and information is not passed on in order to, quote, to protect the confidentiality and impartiality of civil service advice. Well, Mr. Robin Swan. Uh, the Minister has said some stage that he has no responsibility for these letters, but I assume he has responsibility in some stage for the Northern Ireland courts. Is the Minister aware of any of the OTR letters currently being used in a court case in the Northern Ireland courts? Well, again, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, I have no knowledge, nor should I have any knowledge of court proceedings as court proceedings as such. I would only have knowledge where my department was directly involved, and I have no knowledge in that respect. I call Ms Rosie McCorley. Um, can I ask the Minister, would the legal position as such not preclude the naming of individuals in this scheme? Well, my presumption, Principal Deputy Speaker, would be that there would be significant issues under the Data Protection Act regarding the, the naming of individuals. But since it's not my department scheme and I have no knowledge of what detail there may be encompassed within it, I'm not the best placed person to answer that question. I suspect the Secretary of State might be better placed than me. Call Mr. David McNally. Is the Minister telling the House that in the process of transferring devolved power to his office, no papers or files marked on the runs were received by his department from either the Northern Ireland Office or the PSNI? Yes. <laughs> That's a disgrace. I call Mr. Jim Allister. Uh, the Minister claims ignorance of a lot of things, but surely one of the matters that he must have investigated is the startling revelation in the Downey judgment of applications from the Northern Ireland Prison Service in relation to OTRs. If he has made inquiries, what do those inquiries show? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, yes, I have made inquiries. Uh, the issue arose within the prison service when it was uh, the responsibility of the Northern Ireland Office. I have not yet got full details of what role the prison service may have had in that respect, but clearly as the prison service is now part of the DOJ, it is a matter which is of interest to me and which I am following up. I call Mr. Pat Sheehan. I got a free last call. I was going to break a slash in Ira as a coach for Agri. I'm sure the Minister is aware that the Attorney General for England and Wales, Dominic Grieve, said in the House of Commons uh, in regard to the letters, not the John Downey letter, uh, as to the principles underlying the other letters, this was an administ administrative process, one that was certainly lawful. Can the Minister tell us, tell us whether he agrees or disagrees with that particular statement? I'm afraid, Principal Deputy Speaker, I can't since I have no knowledge of the scheme. I'm in no position to judge whether or not it was lawful. Mr. Chris Little. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, can I ask the uh, Justice Minister, given the hurt that has been caused uh, by revelations in relation to this scheme to victims and damage that it has caused to public confidence, would he agree with me that the only way to deal with the past is in an open, ethical and comprehensive manner? Well, yes, Principal Deputy Speaker, I would most certainly agree. We may be in a position where actually dealing with the past has become more difficult as a result of the Downey case, but it has also been proven to me all the more necessary. That's why people are saying they're walking away from talks, they're refusing to discuss the issues which we have responsibility for in this place, seems to me to be a profoundly unwise statement. Whatever the reverberations may be, whatever may emerge from however many inquiries there are, we will continue to bear responsibility in this place for dealing with issues like how we address the past, and it is incumbent on all of us to work together to do that. Well, Ms. Pam Cameron. Thank you, Mr. Principal. Speaker, question number four, please. With permission, Principal Deputy Speaker, I will take questions four and 14 together. The National Crime Agency's remit here should be extended into the devolved area under arrangements that respect our local policing architecture. I believe I have tabled appropriate arrangements to achieve that. I am continuing to press both Sinn Féin and the SDLP to engage with me to resolve any remaining concerns. It has become clear, as feared, that the limitations placed on the NCA locally are having a negative impact. As ACC Drew Harris told the Justice Committee on the 20th of February, 
we can start to really see where cracks are opening up. In particular, the PSNI and others are missing out on the operational assistance that the NCA is providing to forces elsewhere. This includes surge activity in support of and with the agreement of the PSNI. As a direct result, the PSNI is faced with having to divert resources from other priorities or to turn down NCA requests. There is also no mechanism for removing assets through the civil courts from those engaged in criminality in the devolved arena, which is a serious gap. Finally, we are not part of the NCA's planning and priority arrangements. The potential consequences of that are obvious. It is likely that these factors will get worse. The reality is that the longer the impasse, the more the impact. The beneficiaries will be simply organized crime groups. I have recently discussed the issue with the Secretary of State and the Chief Constable. In addition, my officials have been working with the NIO, the Home Office, the PSNI, the NCA and other organized crime task force partners. Gentlemen, for a supplementary. Uh, could I thank the Minister for his answer so far and could I ask if he would agree with me that the parties opposite by their continued opposition to the National Crime Agency are in fact allowing paramilitary organised crime to flourish? Well, what is certainly the effect at the moment, Principal Deputy Speaker, is that it is now um, close on two months since I wrote to the two parties, as Mrs Cameron says, opposite her seeking meetings to discuss what the concerns are and there has as yet been no response to arrange a meeting. It is very difficult for the DOJ to know how we address the problems when we don't know what the problems are. Mr Sidney Anderson. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for that answer and to say that I certainly fully support what my colleague has just said. But would the Minister agree with me that in light of SEC Drew Harris's recent evidence to the Justice Committee that the parties opposite must set aside their anti-British bias and support the full cooperation of the National Crime Agency in Northern Ireland so that the police can properly tackle human trafficking, fuel laundering and other serious crimes? Here, here. Deputy Speaker, I simply want all parties to seek to provide the best possible to support from the relevant agencies to the PSNI in line with the existing policing architecture which we have in Northern Ireland so that we can join up the fight against organised crime most successfully, particularly as Mr Anderson highlights, to deal with dreadful issues like human trafficking. Well, Mr Danny Kinnahan. Thank you very much, uh, Vice President Speaker, and uh, may I thank the Minister for his answer. In his communication with the parties that are against uh, the NCA, has he actually put proposals to them of alternatives or parts that need to be agreed as soon as possible? Well, Mr. Kinnan raises a, a, a very valid point. I think the answer is that we have put several rounds of potential points uh, over various discussions, but the unfortunate reality is that those discussions ceased before Christmas and we have not seen them resumed. We urgently need to get those resumed if we are to join the fight against organized crime with all the implications it has for the issues which have been highlighted. Mr. Joe Byrne. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Would the Minister agree, given all the blanks and communication that exists relating to the OTRs and the other immunity issues, that the SDLP are quite right to be sceptical until all of the accountability mechanisms are sorted out before we agree to implement and go forward with the NCA? Yeah, yeah. Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, I hope the SDLP is not judging the Department of Justice by the standards which the NIO operated in the past. Yeah, yeah. Because what we have sought to do is to ensure that policing architecture is respected, that we have full respect for the roles of the board, for the ombudsman, and the primacy of the PSNI, including the chief constable, being the final arbiter of how the NCA is involved within Northern Ireland. Those are key issues which make major changes to the way it would be operating in any police force area in England, Wales, or Scotland. I believe those are fundamental differences where we have achieved a significant amount. But frankly, if the SDLP has a few more concerns, please come and talk to me. Principal Deputy Speaker, at the risk of sounding repetitious, with permission, I'll take questions 5 and 13 together. Clause 6 of the bill will criminalise the purchase of all sexual ser uh, services in whatever circumstances. I have concerns that this may have unintended consequences. 
For example, I have concerns that those working in prostitution may be at increased risk of violence and abuse and that police may be less able to offer protection against such exploitation. At this time, we do not know enough about the nature and extent of prostitution in Northern Ireland to be able to assess the impact on sex workers and to decide whether Clause 6 is the appropriate course. We need to know what support is available and needed, or questions like are, there sex, are sex workers likely to choose to exit such work in the light of that clause, or what would be the impacts on their welfare and safety if they did not. In dealing with vulnerable people, these questions matter, but Clause 6 does not answer them. We need to be alive to the full facts before we decide whether a legislative course is appropriate, and if so, what. I have therefore commissioned independent research to test these concerns and for which to make proper evidence-based policy decisions on the future of prostitution regulation. In response to the publication of research specifications, tenders have been received. These are being evaluated with the objective of awarding a contract by the end of this month with the expected completion of the research in the autumn. Mr. Hoshin for a supplement. And I acknowledge that the Minister accepts that there will be unintended uh, consequences as a result of Clause 6. Has he any idea of what the mitigating factors uh, that may roll out as a result of this report uh, over the next short while? Well, I think, Principal Deputy Speaker, I said there may be unintended consequences, but that is the key issue about ensuring that we have the research, that we look at what the situation is in Northern Ireland. We don't automatically assume that what works elsewhere will necessarily work within Northern Ireland. And I believe it is important that we see that research through as speedily as possible so that this House can decide whether and if so how it might be appropriate to legislate in the future. Uh, can I call Mr. Cahill Boyle? Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and could I thank the Minister for his answer. But would the Minister agree with me that without this piece of research, the effectiveness of the bill would be undermined? Gourmet Mog. I'm sorry, Principal Deputy Speaker, I didn't catch the end of the question. The effectiveness of the bill would be undermined without the research? Gourmet Mog. Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, I believe that the Human Trafficking and Exploitation Bill provides a comprehensive way of demonstrating that Northern Ireland is part of a widespread UK, Irish, European fight against human trafficking. And I believe that uh, the bills would stand very close examination in the absence of Clause 6. I'm not sure that we can uh, appropriately tackle the issue of prostitution, which is not the same as human trafficking, nor is human trafficking all about prostitution, simply by one clause, which is to some extent ill-defined within a bill. I have been working very positively with Lord Morrow about a number of other aspects of the bill. We have seen significant joining up and agreement between the Department and Lord Morrow, and I suspect also with the Committee on many other aspects of the bill, and I believe it would be important that we see that bill proceed through this House later this year. But I am as yet unconvinced that Clause 6 is the best way to tackle issues like the sex trade. Well, Mr. Patsy McGlone. Uh, I'm glad that the, the Minister did come to the point where he uh, referred to Clause 6 as being ill-defined. Um, perhaps the Minister would then, in light of uh, the recent PSNI evidence to the Committee, where, where they, uh, if you like, retracted on their previous um, opposition to Clause 6 of the Bill, if the Minister could give us some definition then as to what parts of it should be better defined if there are those parts of it which are ill-defined? Well, I think from my point of view, Principal Deputy Speaker, the definition will come at the point when we have seen research, when we have seen what the issue is within Northern Ireland, how the sex trade actually operates here, rather than making assumptions about how it applies elsewhere. So I'm not sure I'm in any position to suggest any better definition for Clause 6 until that research is completed. Okay, and I call Mr. Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Question number six, please. Under the strategies tackling violence at home and tackling sexual violence and abuse, my department has played a significant role in introducing and taking forward many initiatives aimed at protecting and supporting victims and ensuring justice. The 24-hour domestic violence free phone helpline has recently been expanded to also support those affected by sexual violence and abuse. In 2010, multi-agency risk assessment conferences were established 
Since their inception, safety plans and support have been put into place for over 6,300 high-risk victims of domestic violence and abuse. In May of 2013, the Rowan, the Regional Sexual Assault Referral Centre, was established where victims of sexual violence can obtain professional care, advice and support. Since the opening, there have been over 400 referrals. My department has taken forward two specific initiatives. In December 2011, I introduced a process which allows all victims of domestic violence to access legal aid quickly and to go to court and obtain non-molestation orders. My five-year victim and witness strategy was published in June of 2013 and is aimed at improving services to all victims regarding their access to justice. Members will be aware that the draft strategy Stopping Domestic and Sexual Violence and Abuse in Northern Ireland is currently out for consultation. The document contains a number of proposed priorities regarding improving measures of protection and support for victims and witnesses. The responses to the consultation will help develop proposals in this important area. Mr. Dunn for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Principal Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answers. I think we all recognise the success of SARC, the Sexual Assault Referral Centre in Antrim. Does the Minister have any plans to extend that service to other areas of Northern Ireland and indeed considering the use perhaps of a mobile unit to cover rural areas? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, though it was planned before my time as Minister, my understanding is that SARC was located at Antrim because it was believed to be the best possible location for easy access to all parts of Northern Ireland. Uh, I think those of us who have seen the inside of the building would recognise the huge benefits which the building and its specially designed architecture has, and I'm not sure that that service could be replicated easily in any kind of mobile unit. The reality is that those who provide both the medical services, the social care, and where appropriate, the criminal investigation, believe that they have a good facility at Antrim and I'm keen to see it used to the maximum. And I call Mr. Fergal McKinney. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, uh, and I kind of thank the Minister for his answers thus far. Will the Minister assure the, the Assembly that there will be a policy of zero tolerance uh, with regard to, to domestic violence and abuse? Well, I certainly uh, entirely accept the point that Mr. McKinney has made. We need to ensure that there is a policy of zero tolerance. The unfortunate reality is that we know that in many cases, uh, people will suffer domestic violence, let's be realistic, women will suffer domestic violence on many occasions before they will consider reporting it. That's why to some extent seeing an increase in the statistics is actually a good thing if people are more open and better able to report it. But the fact we, you know, we are developing better services, we are getting a joining up between the different agencies is a positive way which I hope will encourage those who are victims of any form of domestic violence to report it and report it speedily. And I call Mr David Michael Veen. Please. Action plans, including one focused on business and rural crime, have been developed to deliver the commitments made in the Community Safety Strategy. An update on the delivery of these plans was provided to the Justice Committee on the 20th of February, and copies of the progress reports for each of the plans are available on my department's website. At a strategic level, my department's work in addressing rural and agricultural crime has included providing funding for, in partnership with NFU Mutual for a rural crime analyst in the Rural Crime Unit and launching a funding package in crime hotspots for the fitting of security equipment to farm vehicles. At a local level, policing and community safety partnerships have developed action plans to address local community concerns, which include the development of tailored solutions to address rural and agricultural crime where appropriate. These include crime prevention initiatives such as trailer marking days, Caesar marking, and farm watch schemes. Mr. McElveen for supplement. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I do thank the Minister um, for his answer. The Minister, I'm sure, will be aware that the recent Perceptions of Crime survey did not include either rural or agricultural crime as part of the questioning that, that was behind it. I, I wonder, with this in mind, would the Minister um, be minded to um, carry out some research specifically around the perceptions um, and fear of crime, particularly in rural and agricultural areas, because, uh, due to this, this blight on our rural communities? Well, I think, Principal Deputy Speaker, the fact that the Royal Crime Unit was only announced at Balmoral Show last year, set up over the summer, is an indication that we're at a relatively early stage. I certainly believe the work which is being done there will ensure that we have better statistics as we look to the future and we seek to ensure that more joined-up approach that I talked about. 
you. And order. That ends the period for oral questions. We now move on to topical questions, and I call Mr. Alban McGuinness. Thank you very much, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. It's widely believed that a, a, a UVF commander is a member of the North Belfast uh, Policing and Community Safety Partnership, and that his position was considered by the Policing Board in March, and a decision was taken not to uh, uh, replace that person uh, on the partnership uh, board in North Belfast. How uh, does the minister react to what, in effect, is a public scandal? Well, I'm certainly well aware of the concerns which Mr. McGuinness has expressed. Um, indeed, the individual he has highlighted is not the only individual about whom concerns have been raised in recent time. The reality is the, the authority to remove a member from a PCSP or, in Belfast, one of the DPCSPs rests with the policing board, can only be uh, carried through on the basis of a, um, a specific set of factors, either the conviction of a serious offence, a serious offence previously uh, committed which has not come to light, or that they have offended against the Declaration Against Violence, which independent members of the boards are required to take. I believe that the standard required on that is effectively the standard of criminal proof. So that is the, the situation which the legal position currently leaves us in. Mr McGuinness, for supplementary. Uh, I, I thank the Minister for his answer. But the Minister is conducting a consultation in relation to policing and community safety partnerships and in relation to membership of those partnerships. Will the Minister uh, assure the House that he will consider, uh, over and beyond the criteria he has uh, outlined, another provision so that this situation cannot arise? Well, um, I have no doubt Mr McGuinness and others will respond to the consultation, making that point robustly. Um, it, it does, however, uh, remain the case that we need to ensure that due process is observed. But if there are suggestions as to how the kind of concerns he has highlighted can be addressed, I will happily listen to them. Order now while people are either putting their question or receiving an answer from the Minister. And I call Mr Declan McAleer. I'll get to the last one for you. Um, the, the Minister... <laughs> the, <laughs> the Chief Whip was talking to me here. <laughs> the, minister, the Minister will be aware of a recent announcement of an additional £103 million pounds being allocated to, de to uh, deal with the issue of hearing loss by former REC officers, bringing the total pot to around £250 million. Is the Minister aware of a growing level of public frustration at the cost of the scheme to public purse? Well, I'm certainly aware, Principal Deputy Speaker, that there are some individuals, including some in this House, who have expressed their concern about the matter. The fact is, however, it is an operational issue for the Chief Constable. It is administered by the PSNI and not by the Department of Justice. And as it's an operational issue, responsibility lies with the Chief Constable. Michael Lear for supplementary. Uh, uh, I'll get the last quick question. Thank you for your response. Um, you know, given the fact that this, this issue uh, predates the devolution, devolution of powers to hear. Is there any potential for some of this cost to be funded by the British government? Well, in fact, not only is there potential, but that is the case that at this stage, uh, uh, the first £12 million in any year at the present time is funded by the DOJ, and anything beyond that is funded by the Treasury. So that is perhaps the slight good news story, if that's what Mr McAleer is seeking. Mr. Ali Geeston is not in his place, so I call Ms. Pam Cameron. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I, uh, first of all, thank the Minister for attending the um, Don't Silence the Violence event in the Long Gallery yesterday? And uh, can I ask the Minister, will he detail what plans his department have to raise awareness of domestic violence as a criminal act? I, I, well, first of all, um, it's, it's always nice when somebody starts a question by thanking me, so I should thank Mrs Cameron for actually being, I think, the first person to thank me other than for the, the generalities of my answers. It's always nice to get a little bit of constituency agreement, especially with you and the Chair, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, 
The answer to how we publicize you know, the fight against domestic violence is a difficult one. It is not something which certainly the department can achieve. It's something which requires the sort of partnership that we saw in the Long Gallery you know, with the number of people involved, um, both from our local women's aid team and from a, people, a number of people from a variety of agencies and from other organizations. The important issue is that, for example, taking account of the video that we saw, that we, we make the maximum possible uh, use of uh, such uh, methods of getting the information out, that we ensure that that is spread, not just amongst MLAs and those already involved, but it's available, and I believe it will shortly be on YouTube if it's not already, so that those who are vulnerable are aware of the circumstances, and in particular, are aware of how they can help, particularly through the 24-hour helpline. Ms Cameron for supplementary. Thank you, and can I thank again my um, constituency colleague and uh, the Minister for his answer. And um, given his answer and in light of the growing statistics of domestic violence, will he ensure that funding voluntary organisations such as Women's Aid will not be cut due to budget pressures elsewhere? And then she goes and spoils it. Um, Principal Deputy Speaker, members will know that I cannot, in the face of the budget pressures on my department, give a categorical guarantee that there will be no cuts. What we have done over the last three and a bit years is ensure that we have protected the grant budget to voluntary groups as far as possible. Cuts within the department, particularly in some core areas of the department, have been significantly more than our budget to support voluntary activity, and I would hope that would continue to be the case. But it also requires this House, for example, to cooperate on dealing with some of the difficult issues we have to deal with, things like the budget for legal aid, to ensure that we have money available to support voluntary activity. And I call Mr. Paul Gervin. Thank you, uh, Mr. Minister. I was wondering, in relation to the Police Federation and uh, public funding coming from your department to that body, uh, some 300 and £25,000 for the 2013 14 year to date. Uh, does that ensure that the body uh, abide by proper procurement rules in relation to tenders that would have to be submitted uh, uh, for that, that group? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, although the Department provides some funding to the Police Federation, the Police Federation remains an independent body run by its own officers and committee who are responsible for issues like proper procurement. My understanding is that an issue which I suspect Mr. Gervin may be hinting at was recently addressed and was found to be dealt with properly. But it's not something which I can do to second guess the way in which an independent body manages its own affairs. Gervin, for a supplement. Uh, thank the Minister for uh, his answer. It doesn't necessarily go the way I would like it to went because I believe that any body which is receiving public money should ensure that that money is being spent in a proper and fully open and accountable manner. Uh, and in doing so, there was a report called the Baker Report, which was commissioned uh, by the Federation, which uh, was processed to try to uh, bury, I'll use that term because uh, it attempted to ensure that it had never seen the light of day. That report was a damning report in relation to the management of the Federation. Here, here. And in light of that, I want to know what the Minister is going to do to ensure that public money, which is being spent to run that organisation, either is withdrawn or is used effectively. And, Principal Deputy Speaker, I can only repeat the point that I have made, that the particular issue which is being hinted at was addressed, was followed up, and it was found that there was no problem about the procurement process. And we need to be very careful in the context of the way the Police Federation operates as an independent body representative of police officers that we are not seeking to micromanage the affairs of the Federation. I suspect most members in this House would not approve of that being done to any body representing staff interests in any part of the public sector. Okay. Mr. Dahi Mackay is not in this place, so I'll call Mr. John Dallet. Uh, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, would the uh Minister acknowledged that the chaplains in our prisons uh, play a critical role in helping to rehabilitate those people who are serving time. Is he concerned that the cut in funding to chaplains will in fact undermine good work that's been done in the prisons? 
Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, I certainly agree with Mr. Dallet that there is extremely good work being done by the chaplains who fill in you know, a, a role somewhat between the number of NGOs which come in and provide assistance in prisons and the, fo the formal prison service structures. Uh, I do not believe that the changes currently being made are seriously damaging that work which is being done. But members will appreciate, as I've just made the point in other areas, that there are serious difficulties in terms of the funding of the DOJ at this time, and it is not possible to fund everything at the level we would wish. But certainly, in what I have seen visiting all three prisons, I have met chaplains in each of them. I've seen extremely positive work being done by all of them. Indeed, my first visit to High Bank Wood, I met one of the chaplains who had long enough to give me a brief handshake before saying, excuse me, but so-and-so wishes to speak to me, and they're more important than you are, in effect. That's, I believe, the quality of the service that's being provided. Uh, John Dallet for a supplement. Speaker, I think the minister has made the point. The chaplain was too busy to talk to even a, a minister. Would the minister reconsider what he's doing and would he reflect seriously on the work which I believe is totally underestimated in rehabilitating people into the world again who, for whatever reason, have, have erred in their ways? Or would he not accept that even the word of God has a price on it? I'm not sure I want to get into the theology of that, Principal Deputy Speaker. No. I repeat the point, I fully recognise the value which is provided by the chaplains in the prisons. I also recognise the value which is provided by many others who go into prisons and provide a service. And it, I've seen some very positive work being done from a variety of different groups working that way, as I see it with the chaplains. But until we can resolve the conundrum of the limits on funding, we cannot fund everything that we would wish to fund to the level we would wish to fund it. But I would certainly uh, take Mr. Dallas' hint and look at the current position in terms of chaplaincy. I call Mr. Kieran McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Yesterday on the floor of this assembly, I was compared to Pontius Pilate. Can the minister uh, tell this House that the, uh, when we're talking about legal highs, that the responsibility lies with the Home Office in Westminster and not with this assembly? And could the minister also update the House on the Prison Service Voluntary Early re re Retirement Scheme? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, I, I didn't think my colleague was entitled to be Pontius Pilate because I was labelled Pontius Pilate by the leader of the Ulster Unionist Party last Thursday evening in a tweet. He, he did actually spell it P-I-L-O-T, which, which as somebody subsequently pointed out at least indicates that he knows where he's going, unlike you, Mike. But the, uh, you know, so clearly there, you know, there is an issue of policy pilots. But before the DUP laughed too much at Mike Nesbitt, yes, a number of DUP members yesterday suggested that I should somehow be changing the law around legal highs in an area which is clearly reserved. Now, I can accept it when nationalists tell me that I should be doing things which are actually reserved to the Westminster Parliament, but it does just seem a little inconsistent when unionists tell me that I should be doing things which are reserved to the Westminster Parliament. I will not do things which I have no legal power to do. I will do my best to do that which I have. On a serious point which Mr McCarthy makes, which really follows on from the point Mr Dallet has just made, um, there are still a small number of senior officers and governors who have not yet received a letter to leave under the voluntary early retirement scheme. I have had meetings, uh, including a meeting not that long ago with the Minister for Finance and Personnel, who has acknowledged that it would be a significant invest-to-save procedure to, uh, to invest in allowing that last tranche of officers who have in many cases stayed a couple of years longer than they thought they might have had to do because the VER scheme has not moved as quickly as we would hoped. We need to give them the opportunity to leave with the same dignity as others have left with. And I certainly hope that we will see the money forthcoming very soon to enable them to go. McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. I sincerely thank the Minister for his quite clear response to my uh, uh, case in relation to the legal highs, and I would now expect that an, a, a full-scale apology would come from, from the DUP benches, including the Health Minister, who accused me of uh, being, being, being uh, the responsibility was for here and the Minister. Can the Minister um, tell the House in relation to the prisoners, uh, that it, uh, the present service, that it is time, it's overdue, that the, uh, the whole thing was brought to a, a successful conclusion in the interest of everybody? Well, I'm not waiting for the apology, Principal Deputy Speaker. I mean, the specific issue is that we are now left with 30, I think it's 38 officers 
who have a right to leave under the voluntary early retirement scheme, who can be replaced because of good work which has been done in terms of training staff, who will have served their time and deserve to go with dignity to allow others come in to take forward the kind of work which has been highlighted by people like Mr. Dallet earlier on. And I am keen to see that happens. I believe that this House and the executive owes it to those officers who served in difficult times that they should now get the opportunity to leave with dignity. Thank you. And that ends question time.